In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's invite now the Holy Spirit to be with us, as we invited Mary to be with us, so we'd like to invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. And the Holy Spirit is our, he's our retreat master. The Holy Spirit has uh, many beautiful titles. And given that we're in this Easter season, we focus a lot upon the Holy Spirit that we encounter in the book, The Acts of the Apostles, known as the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. So let's uh, turn to the Holy Spirit, who's truly the interior master. He's known also as the counselor and the consoler. And let's uh, pray the uh, classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant us by the same Spirit may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, St. Ignatius of Loyola. O God's angels and saints, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. So I'd like to welcome you all to our spiritual exercises program. And uh, we're giving a course on the spiritual exercises program to our friends, our neighbors, couples for Christ in Canada. So we welcome you all to our program. And uh, I'd like to uh, encourage you by promising to pray for you in my Mass I'll be celebrating today. Because uh, there's no greater prayer in the world than the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So we have a priest uh, placing you on the altar in your families. There's a blessing. There's a really great blessing when you have uh, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Um, one of my intentions will be for you that these uh, these weeks in which you're doing the exercise will be the the best weeks in your life. So as um, is the custom of many teachers, and is my custom, I like to just uh, summarize uh, briefly where we're at, and uh, we can. Compare this spiritual exercise program, which is 10 weeks, to building a 10-story building or edifice, where there's a foundation and then there's 10 stories, then there's the roof. There's the roof, just in case it rains, no? <laughs> so uh, our foundation we started with that four weeks ago, is called Principle and Foundation. This is essential for the program as well as for our life, because we have to know where we came from, where we're heading, what is our goal, how to get there, and what are the means that we have to utilize to arrive at our eternal destiny. And we are created by God for this purpose. We are created to praise God, to reverence God, to serve God, 
and by means of that to save our mortal soul. That's the foundation of this program of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola that we're making. So hopefully through spiritual osmosis that's already seeping and sinking and permeating your whole existence such that your your thought process, your decisions, your actions are motivated by principle and foundation. You might even say, I'm a PNF person. <laughs> I'm a PNF person. Maybe blow that up and put on that on your garage door. As well as your mirror, okay? I'm a PNF person. So you you know where you're heading. You're not like a chicken with his head cut off. Or you're driving without the the electronic map. You want to end up in Ottawa, Canada, and you end up in New York because you don't have the right map. <laughs> so we have our spiritual map, don't we? We have our spiritual map. And uh, the destiny is not New York or Manitoba. Rather, our destiny is heaven. Right? And then we we meditate upon what is the major obstacle. And the major, major obstacle to arriving at our goal, you might call it a spiritual detour or roadblock, that's sin. So we started by talking about what Pope Pius XII said many years ago. He said that the, the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. I repeat, the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. You probably know some relatives and friends that Saturday afternoon you're getting up to go out the door and they say, where are you going? I'm going to church. No, oh, why are you going to church today? You, see, you go to church on Sundays. No, once a month they go to confession. What have you done? <laughs> what have you done? You're so bad you have to go to confession. And you say, well... Only God is perfect. I'm a sinner. I go to confession and I receive absolution and I have a lot of peace. And then you might even say to your relatives, if you like, we have enough room in the car. We've got a van. You can have, a, you can have the front seat there and we can go to confession together. No, I haven't done anything wrong. And I haven't killed anyone. I haven't robbed a bank. We meet those people. And they're people that, uh, that don't have a well-formed conscience. And one of the fruits of these exercises is our conscience becoming more refined. You know, the closer we get to the light, the more we can see those uh, splotches on our white dress, right? But walking in the darkness, you might have a couple of stains on your white dress. You're not even aware of it. But once you get closer to the light, that light, that light is Christ, the light of the world. He shines so we can see the darkness within our souls so that we can expunge those dark spots through the blood of the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. So that's the, uh, the second week we were able to meditate upon the triple sin. The sin of the angels, the sin of Adam and Eve, our first parents, the sin of someone who lost his soul because of a mortal sin. We are begging for the grace of the to see sin through the eyes of God. We call that the divine perspective. So we move from there to the following week, still meditating upon sin related to what is called the last thing very serious meditation because you're meditating upon the reality of death. One day we have to die. We know neither the day nor the hour and Jesus says it will come like a thief in the night. Be prepared. Then you meditate upon death, judgment. After we die, we're going to be judged on everything we've ever done the good as well as the bad, even our thoughts. 
These are very serious and sober meditations that motivate us to live a more serious spiritual life. You know, we live in a world that's um, a world that is very superficial, very frivolous, very mediocre, very kind of like the varnish on the top of the wood, no? Very, very superficial. So these meditations help us to become more deep in our spiritual life, arriving at a spiritual depth. And you read the lives of the saints, they may have a lot of, a lot of limitations, but they're not, uh, they're not frivolous or superficial. But rather, they have depths in their spiritual life because they're, they're, they're living according to the Spirit. Living according to the Spirit. So death, judgment, and we talked about the reality of hell. There are people, even Catholics, that uh, deny the existence of hell. And one of the uh, cliches you often hear is, I don't believe that a merciful God could send anyone to hell. You've heard that probably several times. Almost seemed to be a hackneyed and trite phrase, but you hear it. I don't believe that a good, loving, merciful God would send anyone to heaven. The danger of that is that it's a half-truth. But you know what? Half-truth is a half a lie. <laughs> and to be able to sift through that half-truth and half-lie, you have to have some spiritual formation. True in the sense that God doesn't really send us to hell. We choose it because of our, our wrong choices. But hell does exist. We are able to uh, send you one of the uh, numbers from the Diary of St. Faustina, in which you were able to meditate upon the six different uh, chastisements in hell. Faustina also pointed out that she noticed that those who were in hell were those that actually denied the existence of hell. So, we don't want to deny the existence of hell. And as a Protestant pastor, Adrian Rogers, said, there are people that are laughing their way into hell, but they're not going to be able to laugh their way out of hell. <laughs> That's probably no laughing matter, is it? <laughs> they're laughing their way into hell, but they're not going to laugh their way out of hell, because once the door is shut, you can't get out. It's worse than Alcatraz, right? <laughs> so death, judgment, heaven, hell, we believe in heaven. And that's related to principle and foundation, isn't it? That we're created to praise God, reverence God, serve God, and by means of that they go to heaven. So you meditate upon that as well as the overriding theological reality of eternity. Heaven and hell, it's not temporary. Rather, heaven as well as hell, it's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Well, Lady Fatima said that if the world meditated upon eternity, the world would be saved. The world would be saved. So, envelop that those uh, those realities of death, judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory, in the overriding concept of eternity, which means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So, that was the third week. And last week, fourth week, you were able to meditate upon the capital sins the capital sins, begging for self-knowledge and begging for the grace to see what is your kryptonite? What is your fatal flaw, as they say in Greek literature? What is your major weakness? What is it? Even though this is somewhat of a, a painful, eye-opening experience, it's very useful because if we don't know 
ourselves, then we're probably going to be repeating, repeating the same errors. We're never going to change. Socrates goes on to say that a, world, a, a life that's not examined is a life that's not worth living. Desert Fathers give us the two-word axiom, know thyself. And a famous historian went on to say that he who does not know history is condemned to repeat the same errors. Athletes will study the weaknesses of their opponents so that they can win the game. So we have to know ourselves. St. Paul says we're spiritual athletes. He says we're running the race. We're fighting the good fight. So if we don't know what is our, our major weakness, the enemy will, will capitalize. We'll take advantage of that to strike us out or to get a knockout punch or to pin us to the ground as a wrestler, right? <laughs> so we, uh, we have to come to this keen awareness of who we are. The good, but also the bad tendencies. Capital sins are these bad tendencies that we have within us as a result of original sin. These are bad tendencies, you might call them inclinations, or you might call them uh, proclivities that move us in the wrong direction. And if we don't hold them back, then we can become slaves of sin. We're not called to be slaves. We're called to love out what is called the, the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. We're called to be free, not slaves. And Jesus says that sin is slavery. What were those capital sins? Well, we presented to you the capital sins, but at the same time we presented to you the, the opposing virtue that we're called to live. Capital sins would be that of gluttony, lust, avarice or greed, sloth, laziness, envy, anger, and pride. You might say, Father, I've got all those. Well, we all do. But there's got to be a, a dominant one that we have to work most on right now. And it fluctuates. Maybe in 10 years, one of these capital sins that, that is your dominant one is no longer the dominant one. You've got another one. Another one of those capital sins crops off his head like an ugly serpent that wants to bite us, huh? So the opposite of gluttony is temperance, right? Which is the, the, the moderate use of created things. The opposite virtue of lust is chastity. Jesus says, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. The opposing virtue to greed or avarice is generosity. As Mother Teresa says, give until it hurts. The opposing virtue to sloth or laziness is diligence, the work ethic. Huh? You know, our philosophy should be work hard now and we can rest forever in heaven. Amen, no? <laughs> then the opposing virtue to envy would be admiration or, and gratitude. I admire a gift that someone else has and I thank God for the gift that he's given to that person. And I try to cultivate my own gifts. Then the, the opposing virtue to anger is meekness. Meekness is not weakness, but powerful emotion under control. And the, op, the opposing virtue to pride is humility. You might pray, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto you. So that's where we're at. This fifth week, basically the midpoint of our 10-week program, is a week in which we want to immerse ourselves in God's infinite mercy. And as uh, Jesus said to St. Faustina, the greatest attribute of the heart of Christ is his mercy. 
hope that all of you have a beautiful image of divine mercy in your homes and that you look at that often and that when people come into your homes they know that Jesus the King of Mercy here's the King of this couple for Christ household that the divine mercy of Christ and Mary the mother mercy are the king and queen of your house so it's uh, this is a week in which we want to immerse ourselves in God's mercy. And how is this mercy channeled to us? Now, as Catholics, the Catholic Church is a sacramental church. It's a sacramental church. So it's channeled to us through one of the sacraments. And that sacrament is a sacrament of confession. So today we're going to talk about the Sacrament of Confession and I'd like to talk to you about how to make what is called a general confession. When I say general confession, it doesn't mean generic, abstract, abstruse, but rather general confession, confession of our whole lives. This could be one of the greatest experiences in your life. And we talked about St. Ignatius of Loyola, and thanks be to God, and the Jesuits in, in the Philippines, they made a wonderful movie on the life of St. Ignatius, and hopefully you've already seen it. If not, hopefully you'll see it during these next five weeks. One of the turning points in the life of Ignatius was the Battle of Pamplona, when he was wounded. And um, after his convalescence had terminated, he became the pilgrim. One of his first destinations was a place called uh, Montserrat. And what did he do there? He prepared himself to make a general confession of his whole life. And he made it. Now, it took him four to five days. Now, you're not going to take four to five days going to confession, otherwise you'll be visiting that priest as a permanent resident in one of those cemeteries here in Canada. <laughs> Your confession is not going to take five days, no? But uh, you really want to prepare yourself well. And uh, I'd, like to tell a, I'd like to tell a little story now, a personal anecdote, that uh, in, my, in my family, we're, we're nine old together, a big family, is that my mother and father had, had had a boy, then another boy, then another boy, then another boy, and then finally a girl, and her name is Victoria. <laughs> I think there's a Victoria province in Canada, too. <laughs> Victoria. And when she was a teenager, as is often the custom, teenagers become somewhat resistant to certain spiritual practices among which was going to confession. So she didn't go to confession for a while, and my mom is uh, very tenacious, doggedly insistent when she wants something to be done. So she in invited my sister Vicky to go to confession, and my sister was rebuffing my mom. Then, until after several months, my mom's prayers and gentle but tenacious insistence, my sister said, okay, I will go to confession, but under one condition, I don't want to go face to face to the priest because he knows me. Because we knew the older pastor and uh, my sister wanted to be anonymous. So mom, my mom said, hey, no problem. You can just go behind the screen. So the fatal day arrived in which my sister... Uh, was going to go to confession, and she went behind the screen, and try to imagine that this is the screen, okay? She went in behind the screen, and she said, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was nine months ago. And the priest did this. Oh, hi, Vicky. <laughs> oh, hi, Vicky. <laughs> ah! <laughs> well, that broke the ice. And then she went to confession, has been going to confession with a certain frequency ever since. But I, I tell that story because before major victories in our life, 
often the devil tries to get in there to try to put up roadblocks. Probably even before you did these exercises, you had had some roadblocks, some temptations. Maybe physical, maybe something wrong with the household, but often there's something mental. Where the devil enters in and he says, you know, that 10 week program, that's a long time. Meditating upon the Word of God, yeah, I could do 15 minutes, but Father Room's hour, what's that's too much. You know, maybe, maybe do it next year. No hurry. Do it next year. That's uh, that's going to be a good year. 2023 sounds better than 2022. <laughs> and this is uh, this is the temptation of the devil. Unless I tell you, you're not aware of it because the devil is very crafty. He's very wily, isn't he? He's very astute. And Jesus calls him the father of lies. <laughs> he's the father of lies, and the fact that he's the father of lies, we're not even aware that he's lying to us. So, uh, a temptation could be, well, I, I don't want to do that confession. I'm really not that bad, okay? You know, I'm not really that bad. And these are, uh, these are lies concocted by the, by the enemy. So you, you want to rebuff him. So uh, <coughs> what is this idea of a general confession and uh, why and how are we going to do it? Well, as we mentioned, the general confession is you want to go through your life and you want to confess, you want to confess everything. Get it all out. It's uh, spiritual sp spring cleaning, so to speak. We want to get it all out. We want to clean out the basement and the attic and the uh, living room of our house. Huh? Try to imagine you have uh, a very important guest that's going to come to visit you. You want to clean the house, right? You want to clean that house. You want to clean the house so that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will come into the, the inner chamber of your hearts with great joy. Right? Teresa of Avila speaks of us in the means of the interior castle, which the king wants to come to visit us. Huh? So um, that's, uh, that's what it is, confessing the sins of your past. Now, you might, ask, you might even ask, why should I do this? And I'll give you some reasons. One of the reasons is because our patron saint, I've got a statue of him here, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, here's our patron saint, he himself made the general confession and he exhorts us to do it. And I personally try to follow the advice of the saints. First of all, Jesus Christ, but then the saints, they're reflections of Christ. So we can't go wrong if we're following in the footsteps of the saints. If we follow the advice of Hollywood, we can easily be misled, right? But following the footsteps of the saints, you can't go wrong. That's why, that's why they're in heaven. Another reason would be this. And uh, we've got to be dead honest with ourselves. As a whole, since... Vatican II, there has been an overall uh, weakness in catechesis, I'd say, throughout the world. Throughout the world. An overall weakness in catechesis throughout the world. And one of the, one of the dimensions of that weak catechesis has been a, a weak catechesis on confession and on the formation of the conscience. And this is almost worldwide. It certainly hit the United States and Canada, maybe even more, in which there's been a really weak, watered-down teaching of catechesis. I remember no, 
I remember hearing the story of a, of a woman that was in a parish here in the United States that had to go to the pastor and fight the pastor to uh, to confess the children before their first communion. And he had, she had to go to the pastor and the DRE, which is a very liberal nun, and say, look, you know, the children have to go to confession before they make their first communion. And the priest didn't give importance to confession. And she brought in canon law, the catechism of the Catholic Church, but the pastor didn't like that. So, pray for priests. Uh, pray for liberal parishes. Pray that you can offer this confession in reparation for the many sins of our past, but as well as the sins of the world. So, that's the first week reason. It's just a, a general, weak, deluded catechesis which reflected itself in the poor formation of the conscience, the neglect of going through the Ten Commandments, and the putting off of confession. So that's another reason. And then still another reason would be, and I think we have to be honest with ourselves, that possibly in our past we did not confess a sin or sins because of fear or because of shame. I don't want to confess that. That one is a, that's a really embarrassing sin. I think I'll, uh, I'll just, I'll put that off. No? Or I'll say something very generic so we won't, the priest really won't understand. Okay? You can do that, right? But you know, as priests, we, we are given the ability to absolve sins, but not to read minds. You know, Padre Pio could, but not all priests, no? To absolve sins, we can. That comes from holy orders. But to read minds, not too often. So you you may have you may have purposely hid an embarrassing sin when you were a young adult or a teenager, and you've really never gotten that out. And if you haven't gotten it out, it's a certain spiritual rotting process that's taking place in your heart. We start to rot. You know, if we don't get rid of uh, a bacteria, we don't get rid of dead wood or mold, then there's the rotting process that takes place. So we don't want to be spiritually rotting, do we? We want to be spiritually flourishing and growing. Now I'm going to say another, another reason why, and this is very pertinent to the, the overall context of the family. And I'm addressing myself especially to Couples for Christ in Canada, but I'm addressing myself to uh, married people as a whole. Usually in most cases, the week before you get married, or the two weeks, or even the month before you get married, what are you thinking about mostly? Well, as uh, the future bride, the wedding dress, is it going to be white or beige? The crown that you put on your head? The bouquet of roses, will the roses be red or white? Maybe a mixture of both. These transcendent, important realities of the human situation, right? How about the rug? Should it be red or should it be pink? What about after? Rice, ah, no custom, bubble stuff, you know? What about those guests that are coming in from Manila to Toronto? Got to pick them up. And all these social preparatory topics surface but you're not thinking about your spiritual life. Your spiritual life is the last thing you're thinking about, or as it should be, the first thing you're thinking about. 
We know in sacramental theology it's called dispositive grace. You receive as many graces as you dispose yourself to receive. And it may have been that before you got married, you gave in to premarital sex more than once. Maybe you skipped Mass more than once. Maybe you got drunk more than once. Maybe you looked at pornography more than once. Maybe you got high on drugs more than once. Objectively, these are mortal sins. Objectively, these are mortal sins. So if you you get married going through the ceremony of matrimony with these mortal sins that are still within your soul, what happens? Got to be honest with you, there's a sacrilege there because you have to receive the sacraments in the state of grace. And you don't go up to the Eucharist in mortal sin. You don't go and receive matrimony or holy orders or confirmation in mortal sin. You've got to reconcile yourself with God sacramentally through confession. Yeah. And it could be as a result of not making that good confession, even though you're married 20 years, you've never really been at peace. You've really never been at peace with God, with your wife or husband, with your children, and even with yourself. You've never experienced that peace that you're longing for. And now, as Father Broom is giving you this, uh, this conference this morning, many of you are kind of looking at each other, nodding and saying, well, Father Broom is right. We, we didn't go to confession before we got married, and yes, you know, we, we did commit some mortal sins. So consider this day to be possibly the best day in your life. Finally, you've heard a priest talk about something that has really been bothering your conscience over the past 20 years. And you've been in denial. Let's be honest. We can lie to ourselves. We can rationalize. We can justify. We can intellectualize. We can do that. A human person is capable of fabricating the biggest lies and saying that those lies are the truth. As you have here in the United States, pro-choice. No, it's, it's pro-murder. It's called euphemisms, right? So uh, I know what I'm saying is very is very strong, but I say it with great love because uh, I care for the salvation of your soul. And you're going to find once you make this sacramental confession, the chant of confession, this will probably be a turning point in your life in which you probably felt that something was really blocking your spiritual progress, and it's probably this. You might even think of this. In your pipe, sometimes the pipes in your house, they get clogged. you got to get some Drano, you know what the Drano is, to unclog. We want to do our spiritual Drano process, okay? Or you got cholesterol. you got to take certain medicine to get that cholesterol out of your veins. Otherwise, you're going to have a heart attack or maybe a, maybe a stroke. Or a spiritual cleansing. Take a shower every day. This is a spiritual ba uh, bath or a shower. You're going to feel much better. Much better. Spiritually, emotionally. And this will redound upon your family. Who will benefit? You will, your spouse, and your three kids. As well as all the couples for Christ, because Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. We are responsible for our own salvation first, but then for the salvation of others. And for the salvation of others. So hopefully I've convinced you to... Uh, to uh, prepare to make this general confession. All right, I have to say something that's very delicate, but it has to be said. Uh, 
some priests may, may not understand this. Okay, some priests may not understand what is this idea of a general confession. If you've already confessed the sins in the past, why do you confess sins of the past that have already been confessed? Well, true, but there are some sins in the past that were not confessed. <laughs> That's what you have to say. And there, there's some serious mortal sins that I never really confessed before, so I really, I want to make, I want to have a clean slate. So, uh, you, you might, you might try to find maybe an Opus Dei priest, or maybe there's a Jesuit priest, or maybe a religious priest that understands the whole dynamic of the gender confession. And uh, your gender confession is going to take a little bit longer than just say a normal confession. It's going to take a little bit longer. But I would invite you all to do it at a, at a good pace. So I'll explain how to do it. And then you have to try to pray, to, try to pray that you find a confessor that will, will help you to make the gender confession. And I repeat, if you've held back a mortal sin in the past, you know you really have to do it. And once that's done, then the sacrament of marriage, the grace, are going to start to flow. They're going to start to flow. It's like they're dammed up, and once you break that dam, the waters flow, right? The draino, you know, put the draino in the, in the pipe system, and the water starts to flow. Okay, so how are you going to make a gender confession? All right, online we're going to be posting... Uh, We'll be posting a, um, an examination of conscience booklet by Father Altier. There, you're going to have the examination of conscience booklet. And give yourself, give yourself a good block of time to, do, to prepare yourself for the gender confession. In other words, the better the, the, better the preparation, the more abundant the graces. We mentioned this. This is called dispositive grace. You receive abundance of graces uh, commensurate with or in proportion to your prior preparation. I've, we've been given these exercises for about 17 years, 17 to 18 years, so we've been doing it for a long time. And uh, we've had about a thousand people that go through the exercises here in um, United States, uh, most in Southern California, every year. And here in the United States, last year we we did online for the Couple for Christ for about was about ten thousand people. So uh, people, many people have gone through our program. So uh, most of the people will spend a whole morning or an afternoon, or a night, give yourself a block of time. Give yourself, I would say, a good three to four hours in which you're able to really prepare yourself really well. Do it well, because this, this could be the most important moment in your life. Take it seriously. And your sanctification, your salvation, and the sanctification and salvation of others depend upon this. So find, find the time, a good block of time, a place where there's silence. Silence. Because if there's a lot of noise, a lot of interruptions, you're not going to be able to examine your conscience in great depth. You have to have silence. So with that booklet and your praying in front of the image of Divine Mercy, Our Lady Perpetual Help, the statue of St. Joseph, create the milieu. It's also important that when you make your examination of conscience, you're preparing for your general confession, that you write out your confession. You write it out. Because if you don't write it out, when you go to confession, most definitely you're going to forget something. And then you'll leave the confession, I forgot to say the most important thing. So you want to make sure that you, you're, you're writing it out. And you're writing out, especially the, the mortal sins, the, the number and kinds of mortal sin, because 
Canon law and the Catechism of the Catholic Church says when we go to confession, we have to mention the number of mortal sins and the species also. So there you have it. Go through the Ten Commandments in the booklet and uh, just go through the commandments categorically, one at a time, and have your pencil and your pad of paper there and write them down. Write them down. All right, this... I'm going to give you then the, the five classical steps of making a good confession. So the first is the examination of the examination of conscience on the Ten Commandments. The second is this is very, very important step to make a good confession, and it is sorrow or contrition for sin. It's because if we go to confession but we don't really have sorrow, it's, uh, it's an exercise in futility. You have to be sorry. So the sorrow that you're going to be begging for, and you have to beg for the grace. You're going to hear me time and time and again in the exercises, beg for the grace. Beg for the grace. Beg for the grace for a deep and sincere sorrow. Now, there's actually two types. There's, it's called imperfect sorrow contrition, and then there's perfect sorrow contrition. Imperfect would be the following. Well, I don't want to commit that mortal sin, because if I die, I could lose my soul for all eternity. Well, you meditate upon two weeks ago the reality of hell. None of us want to go to hell. And that is called fear of the Lord, which is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Old Testament says that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So being motivated by fear of the Lord, it's not perfect, but it's a start. But perfect contrition or contrition of love is this. I don't want to sin. And the principal reason why I don't want to sin is because I know that God loves me. He sent His Son to die on the cross for me. He shed His precious blood for me. He died for me. And I want to show my love for Him in return. That's called perfect contrition. So really you want both. You want to have fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. But you want to supersede that and go beyond that by having the grace of perfect contrition. But you have to beg for the grace. You have to beg for the grace. So these spiritual exercises, we have to be led by the Spirit. We have to open ourselves to the Holy Spirit and His gifts and the many graces He wants to bestow upon us. So that's the uh, second step, classical step of making a good confession in general. The third step would be, it's called firm purpose of amendment. Firm purpose of amendment means this that we want to avoid the near occasion of sin and do all within our possibilities not to go back to that sin. In other words, not to play with fire. You play with fire, you're going to get burnt. Not to walk on the slippery slope, you're going to fall. There in Canada, you know, not to walk on ice in the winter. You can fall through the ice and it can be pretty cold, that water. <laughs> and the Bible, the Old Testament teaches us, he who plays in danger will perish in danger. You don't want to... You want to avoid the near occasion of sin. So, if in your life there's any person place, thing, circumstance 
that has led you into sin in the past, you want to avoid that. Maybe there's a person, and you're, you're, you're a married person, and you've had some contact with a, another person personally or online or a telephone call. Hey, you want to cut that out. Maybe you've been toying with the pornography. Okay, you want to take means to avoid that. Maybe you've had problems with drinking, okay? Well, let's just go to the pub and let's just let's, let's look at the whiskey there at the pub. That's dumb. So we have to... We, that's why self-knowledge is so important in the capital sin, because we're getting to know ourselves, the good within us, but also our weaknesses. That's called um, firm purpose of amendment. Firm purpose of amendment. Then the fourth step is this. We confess our sins to the priest. We confess our sins to the priest. So I, I'll pray for you. You'll be able to find a priest that will uh, will give you, you know, give you hopefully a good fifteen, maybe twenty minutes. I mean, if the priest is not in a hurry, give you a half hour. If he's not in a hurry, you might even set up an appointment with the priest. Not the normal confessional line, but a, a set time for the priest. Father, I'd just like to. You just give me a half hour. I want to make this general confession. And if I can just get it all out, you can maybe coach me. And I want to do it well. And if you can find a priest that has maybe a half hour, 20, 25 minutes, to give you time, you can do it calmly and peacefully, and it could be the best experience in your life. Now, when you arrive at the confessional, um, let's go through um, the bolts and nuts of making a good confession, the practical protocol. You start with the sign of the cross. Okay, you have your you have your sins written down, as we mentioned. Start off by saying, "Bless me, Father, for I've sinned." My last confession was a month ago. Father, this is a general confession. Then what you should do is simply read off the sins and don't make any long commentary. And don't go into into unnecessary details. There was a program um, in in the United States, maybe in Canada too, back back in the '60s. It was um, Get Smart. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Dragnet. Dragnet. Yeah, that's right. Dragnet. Thank you. Dragnet. In which um, you he said. He said, just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. Well, just the sins, ma'am. Just the sins, ma'am. So, you want to just go in and tell the sins that you've confessed. Now, you have to do it this way. Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. My last confession was a month ago. This is a general confession. Read through the list. And you have to mention the number of mortal sins. In species, with respect to the sins in the Sixth and Ninth Commandment, you have to mention the types. Was it masturbation? Was it fornication? Was it a homosexual act? Was it adultery? Was it incest? You have to mention the type of sin it was in, with respect to the Sixth and Ninth Commandment. Now, St. Faustina, in the diary, she highlights the three most important virtues to make a good confession and says that it should be, it should be transparent, transparency, humility, and obedience. Those three virtues. Transparent means you've got to be clear. Call a spade a spade. Don't beat around the bush. You don't put um, a marshmallow on top of cow manure, right? Be honest. Tell it as it is. 
Transparency is a sign of the Holy Spirit. Whereas being murky and clear is a sign of the bad spirit. Bad spirit, confusion. Holy Spirit, transparency, clarity. Then, humility. Humility, tell it that as it is and don't blame other people. You might say, well, Father, you know, I fought with my husband, but if you really knew him, if you really knew my husband, you'd cut me some slack. Uh-uh. There is a hidden type of pride in that, in which you're really not admitting that you have sinned. I love Psalm 51, which is the, the act of contrition of David after he committed sin with Bathsheba, then he kills an innocent man, Urias. He says, I have sinned. I have sinned. My sin is always before my eyes. I have sinned. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. A broken and humble heart, O Lord, you will not spurn. And then obedience. When the priest gives you advice, he gives you a penance, Okay, I would like you to say five Hail Marys. How about two, Father? You're kind of arm wrestling the priest to kind of lower the penance, no? No. The last time I went to confession, the priest gave me five Hail Marys. I said five decades of the rosary. What do you think? So, give me the penance, I'm going to do more. And that's a sign of goodwill. It's a sign of goodwill. Certainly good will. So there you there you have the conditions, the virtues. Okay. Then you say the act to contrition. Then the priest gives you absolution. And he says these beautiful words. And I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No, I did not give you general absolution right now. I can't do that. No, I can't give you absolution online. No, don't think that would be that would be heresy. No, you got <laughs> you got to go to the priest. So with those words of absolution, they're beautiful. Your sins are forgiven. And that beautiful passage from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter one: Though your sins be as red as scarlet, I'll make them as white as the snow. That's the fourth step. And the fifth step of making a good confession is you carry out the penance that the priest gives to you. Now, as I mentioned, this priest gave me, okay, I want you to say five Hail Marys. Fine. I said five decades of the rose. Not that you have to do that, but when I go to confession, I really try to confess well. I want to be generous with God, and we know that God cannot be outdone in generosity. If we're generous with God, God is going to be double, triple gener generous with us. So carry out the penance. Whatever it might be, carry out the penance. So once that's done, you will have made a good confession and you, we hope, will have made a general confession, the best confession in your life. So, as a recap, this is the week of God's mercy. The week of God's mercy. Give thanks to the Lord for His good, for His mercy endures forever. And just a recap of those steps you're going to be making to make a good confession. Number one, examination of conscience in which you're writing down your sins. Number of mortal sins and species. Number two is contrition for your sins. You have to beg for the grace of imperfect contrition, fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Perfect contrition is, I don't want to sin anymore because God loves me so much and I want to love him in return. Third would be third firm purpose of amendment. I want to avoid any person, place, or thing that can lead me to sin. To avoid the near occasion of sin. 
or they go to the priest who represents Christ and I confess my sins to him in number and species mortal sins. And I want to make sure that these, this confession is done with great transparency, humility, and obedience. I receive absolution and then I carry out the penance as soon as I can. With that, my friends, you have made a general confession. All of your sins are washed away and your soul becomes as white as the snow. So this week, I'm going to make a novena for all of you. Starting today, nine days in a row, I'll pray for you as a secondary intention in all of my Masses so that you will make the best confession in your life and you'll be born again. So let's pray to Our Lady of Perpetual Help that she'll help us to make the best confession in our lives and we'll be born anew. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.